Welcome to everyone. This is the second clinical meeting of West Bengal Academy of Pediatrics 2022. Uh, we are really happy to have uh, Apollo Glen Eagles presenting their cases to us in this meeting. And uh, we are really eagerly waiting to hear uh, the details of these absolutely captivating captions uh, that have been provided in the flyers. So uh, let us start without any further delay. There are some um, important announcements about future meetings, etc., that Indranil will provide during the course of the meeting. But I think we can start now. Uh, Dr. Shubrata De is the HOD of uh, academic of the pediatric department of Apollo Glen Eagles, and he will be the moderator for the course of events. Shubrata uh, please take over. Thank you, Sushmita. Uh, it's a privilege. It's a privilege to be uh, with WBAP on this very August platform. Uh, we have had a robust DNB program for the last fifteen years, and uh, this is the day the postgraduate students look forward to to showcase their talent as well as the myriad amazing cases that they encounter during their residency. And it's truly a privilege for them to be presenting the cases to the entire audience composed of pediatricians and those in training. So we have six cases, some extraordinarily rare presentations of common illnesses and some extremely uncommon conditions which we will have on display today. So without further ado, I will introduce the two anchors uh, who will conduct the meeting, Dr. Amrita Roy and Dr. Chandrai Bhattacharya. So let me call upon Dr. Chandrai Bhattacharya and Dr. Amrita to uh, take the meeting forward. Please. A very good afternoon to our uh, esteemed audience, uh, our judges, uh, pediatricians, colleagues, and junior doctors who have gathered for this uh, interesting discussion that we're going to have today on uh, behalf of the West Bengal Academy of Pediatrics monthly clinical meeting. Um, we'll go a little bit through the housekeeping tips. We'll allot around eight minutes for each case followed by two minutes for discussion. We will have a uh, discussion at the end of each case, as well as we'll have time for discussion at the end of the session. Uh, if there are any questions, you can ask us directly, or you can put your comments in the chat box, any questions, any suggestions, you can put those in the chat box and we'll address them at the end of each presentation. Without much ado, I'll hand over the mic to Dr. Chandri, who is with me. The first speaker is Our training program. He will be speaking of uh, a very common but a very interesting case uh, for all of you. Thank you. Dr. Devojyoti. Yes. Uh, 
डॉक्टर देवज्योति Good afternoon, everyone. Today, I will present before you an interesting, interesting case of an adolescent kid who was brought to our hospital on stretcher in a debilitating condition and finally went back home on his feet. This 14-year-old adolescent kid presented to us with complaints of swelling of bilateral lower limbs since a few days, which increased over last three days. There was associated complaints of cough. intermittent low grade fever with night sweats history of weight loss decreased appetite early satiety excessive lethargy over past few months the child had a weight of 37 kg with a bmi of 15 kg per meter square which was just below the 10th quintile general examination revealed a lethargic and sick looking child having tachycardia <coughs> pallor clubbing bilateral edematous inflamed feet with minimal ascites chest auscultation revealed decreased air entry on left inframammary left infrascapular and infraaxillary areas with bronchial breath sounds on left inframammary and interscapular areas there was increased focal resonance on left infrascapular area based on the history and clinical examination our provisional diagnosis was pulmonary tuberculosis with acute lymphangitis of both legs malnutrition with anemia and ascites this is the test x ray which the child brought with him which shows homogeneous opacities involving the mid zone and lower zone of left lung Initial blood investigations revealed iron deficiency anemia with elevated inflammatory markers and this electrolytemia with hypoalbuminemia. The child was seronegative for hepatitis B and HIV and thyroid. Here, in this slide, we can see the CT scan showing consolidation, necrotic areas, and bronchial changes in the left lower zone and mid zone. Sputum microscopy showed. acid fast bacilli and pulmonary tuberculosis was confirmed with gene expert positive rifampicin was sensitive this finding was later on corroborated by line probe assay and bacteric culture the child was started on first line anti tubercular drug intensive phase but on fifth day of hospitalization the child had dyspnea with decreased air entry on the left side this thing settled over next 4 days with supplement supplementation of oxygen apart from management of tuberculosis we managed lymphangitis with antibiotic chest physiotherapy was continued dietitian was consulted and nutritional rehabilitation was started albumin infusion was prescribed and psychiatric consultation was done tuberculosis is a pretty common disease in our society but what makes this case special is the challenges that we faced along here comes this challenges we had uh, faced the challenge of hiv induced hepatitis nutritional rehabilitation psychiatric issues were dealt there was no improvement in air entry with conventional management and this propelled us to think hard and finally we discovered endobronchial tuberculosis left bronchial stenosis was quite a challenge and finally we dealt with steroid induced hypoglycemia on 8th day of the starting anti tubercular treatment the child had clinical jaundice with elevation of liver enzymes more than 5 times so we modified our uh, anti tubercular drugs hepatroxic first line att were withdrew and uh, levofloxacin and streptomycin were started with this management the liver enzymes normalized and gradual introduction of rifampicin isoniazide and pyrazinamide in a lower dose did not change the liver enzymes finally we increased the dose to optimal level decreased level of albumin caused impaired drug binding thereby increasing the free drugs which are hepatotoxic this explains the att induced hepatitis in our index case fluoxetine and olanzapine was started in view of depressive reaction in view of persistent tubercular effusion usc guided pleurosynthesis was done which showed exudative pleural effusion with borderline elevated of adenosine deaminase but this time zedenstein did not show any acid fast back line as there was no improvement in air entry we did a bronchoscopy which showed severely stenosed stenosed left main bronchus with caseous necrosis and pus and finally we came to the diagnosis of endobronchial tuberculosis tuberculosis is known as king of all diseases and we were dealing with a difficult case of tuberculosis that justifies our title of presentation 
in view of repeated pleural effusions vats decortication was planned but permission was refused repeat bronchoscopy was done on 10th of december which again showed endobronchial tuberculosis pictal catheter was introduced and pleural fluid was drained and this drain was kept in situ so that we could instill intrapleural streptokinase for three consecutive days with this treatment improvement was noted here we can see stenos left main bronchus but, but partial dilatation could be achieved with balloon dilatation throughout the course of hospital stay we did four times bronchoscopy in this kid and two times balloon dilatation with this significant air entry could be achieved on the left lung intensive phase 8 ended after two months and continuation phase of antitubercular treatment was started on 6th of january next challenge was hyperglycemia due to prolonged steroid therapy the child had developed steroid induced hyperglycemia which was associated with increased level of c peptide pediatric endocrinologist was consulted and the dose of steroid was tapered diet was modified and finally uglecemia was achieved here we are showing the serial chest x rays we can see with bronchoscopy air entry improved on the left apical zone nutritional rehabilitation was quite a challenge when the child came we started the child on 1000 kcal calorie diet with 40 grams of protein by continuous nasogastric feeding after one and half month the child could accept oral diet and then after two months of hospital stay steroid induced hyperglycemia <coughs> was evident for which dietary modification was done and finally the child child was put on 800 kilo calorie diabetic diet with 90 grams of protein when we study the trend of body weight of the child we find a dip after 14 days of hospital stay which is explained by correction of hypoalbumin hypoalbuminemia and successively there is a constant weight gain that is evident in the graph and we discharge the child with a weight of 39.4 kg <laughs> literature review helped us determining and guiding intrapleural streptokinase for tubercular pleural effusion the literature shows intrapleural streptokinase reduces the need for major surgical intervention summarizing our case from diagnosis of pulmonary tuberculosis was done with start of uh, in intensive phase of antitubercular drug with first line attts antipsychotics were added in view of depressive reaction att induced hepatitis was dealt with bronchoscopy clinched the diagnosis of endobronchial tuberculosis and steroid was started repeated bronchoscopy and balloon dilatation helped in air entry of the left main bronchus steroid induced hyperglycemia was managed conservatively and the child was put on conservative on continuation phase of antitubercular therapy in short this was the this of a two and a half month long eventful hospital course and finally this child was discharged with a smile on his face and oxygen in his lungs thank you can i come in yes arun of course yeah i have one simple question i did at any point of time You, did you consider multi drug resistant tuberculosis that's one and did you get any relevant contact history for the child yes sir the child had a contact history with maternal uncle and uh, we did not consider uh, multi drug resistant tuberculosis because uh, rifampicin was sensitive and even in uh, line probe assay we could find that it was sensitive to rifampicin and isoniazide fine Yeah, Dr. Bhuiya, if he has anything to ask, then it, it is open to discussion from the audience. Thank you very much for listening. If there are any questions, we are happy to take it now. One humble suggestion from our side: if you can please put your uh, microphone on mute, uh, mute mode while uh, the presentation is ongoing, because it, we could hear some additional sounds. I think there is a question from uh, Dr. Basudev Patro. that uh, yeah endobronchial tb but yeah. raised query parenchymal lesion as well Can yeah yeah sir endobronchial tb is often associated with parenchymal lesion as we know that while the uh, bronchus is invaded by the inflamed uh, lymph nodes this tuberculosis can spread to the uh, lung parenchyma also so it is a finding that we often get with endobronchial tuberculosis okay. 
it is a combination sir i have okay. one question <clears throat> how long should we continue steroid then when to stop how do you judge so steroid is mainly for uh, tubercular pleural effusion and when the pleural effusion resolves we can taper down the dose of steroid endobronchial tv uh, so generally for tubercular effusion we give uh, four months of uh, had there been no effusion of, had there been no effusion so there is uh, in endobronchial tb steroid is prescribed but it does not have a proven role so you have continued steroid mainly for pleural effusion yes sir for both uh, endobronchial component and uh, tubercular pleural effusion now, had it been only endobronchial you would not have continued for yes sir we had we would have started steroid Okay. Thank you very much for that excellent interaction. Uh, one more question in the chat box, if you could take it. The yeah. cause yes. of the lymphangitis, the leg lymphangitis. Deputy, please. So there was a uh, hypoalbuminemia resulting in edema of the bilateral lower limbs, and there was secondary bacterial in infection complicating the situation. That explains bilateral lymphangitis. Thank you. What is the common organism? You have used pindamycin, right? Yes, sir. Staph or yes. Did you go for uh, any culture and sensitivity? No, sir. It responded with uh, clindamycin only. Okay. So blood culture was negative. Did you subtract? I think we should move on. So we'll be moving on to our next presentation and Chandri is going to introduce our next presenter. Uh, next up is Dr. Shubhrodit Das, uh, another second year uh, DNB trainee in our unit. And he will be speaking about a very interesting and a novel case. And uh, I'll invite Dr. Shubhrodit Das now for his presentation. Screen share to Kurabi. Cursor. Not screenshot, you're fine. Uh, good afternoon to everyone. Good afternoon to everyone. I am myself, Dr. Supradeep, DNB trainee, Apollo Multi Specialty Hospital. Here I am going to discuss one interesting case, and the title has been given uh, Trouble with the Gatekeeper. Uh, 
uh, one year nine month old male child from patna bihar admitted on 16th august 2021 One year nine month old male child uh, admitted uh, with male child admitted from in one year sorry sorry to interrupt one year nine month old male child from Patna Bihar admitted on sixteenth August two thousand twenty one with the complaining of repeated episodes of seizure since one and a half month of age they went for in the local hospital for the uh, evaluation they worked up done there the hypocalcemia was diagnosed and the child received IV and as well as oral mag- calcium. But still, seizure was persistingly there. So they went to the Central Institute for the hypocalcemia workup. There they found low PTH with low magnesium. Child received magnesium supplementation. Still, any intermittent symptoms were controlled. So child brought to our nephrology as well as uh, endocrine OPD for the further management. So child is known case of Randy Walker malformation while being diagnosed previously for the seizure workup. Family history, birth history, immunization history are unremarkable. Developmental history is delayed. Mention was noted. And general physical examination and system examination, apart from mild pallor, uh, general survey are within uh, normal limit. And systemic examination wise, uh, neurological examination and other systemic examination within normal limit. Anthropometry wise, length is on third centile, weight is on twenty fifth centile. Head circumference is. Between 30 to 97 centile. Urea and electrolytes on admissions are urea, creatinine, sodium, potassium, and chloride are within normal limit. Here we can see the calcium uh, and magnesium and parathyroid hormone are both are below normal limit. So hypomagnesemia. Yeah, hypomagnesemia. The child is having hypomagnesemia. Here, yeah, child. Magnesium is an important element for the body physiology, which will. Helps in nerve conduction effect. So hypomagnesia causes are broadly divided under four headlines: gastrointestinal, renal, genetic, and miscellaneous causes. The causes are shown in the slides. So for the detailed history worked up here, uh, there is no loose stool uh, or uh, GI malabsorption. Uh, no history of PPA or long-term antacid use. No history of uh, use of diuretics. Uh, for, uh, in view of renal loss, uh, weight loss is not there in the view of male absorption. So further biochemical evaluation we did to uh, for this child. Uh, here fractional excretion of magnesium was negative, zero point four percent, that is below two uh, percent, and uh, the celiac screening was done, that is negative. So twenty four hours urinary magnesium is below ten, and the magnesium. Uh, function fraction excretion of magnesium is below two percent. That is evaluates the uh, loss of action through the kidney is ruled out. So what is the cause? Here in this child, as we have seen earlier, that hypocalcemia is there with the low pH, but normal physiology used to the in the body. If there is low calcium, then pH will be rise. But in this case, instead of hypocalcemia, pH is also low. This is due to secondary hypomagnesemia. Here is the interdependence. Once there is decreased magnesium, then cyclic AMP generation will be impaired. Parathyroid hormone secretion will be decreased. Calcium in the blood will be decreased. So, what is the diagnosis? Is it the di- um, problem in the gatekeeper? The, instead of giving oral supplementation of the magnesium as well as the di- in magnesium rich diet, the child is not able to hold the magnesium. What is the Problem in the body. So TRP M6 and M7 has been noted uh, for the gatekeeper of human magnesium metabolism. See here in this screen, uh, we can see uh, TRP M6 uh, present in the brush border epi- in the epithelium as well as in the conv- uh, distal convoluted tubule. But uh, like in, in maximum u- in urine, uh, the magnesium used to loss. Uh, the mainly in through kidney proximal convoluted tubule magnesium used to absorb by 15 to 20 percent 
ascending lumpur mainly by 65 to 70 percent and 75 percent and only digital convoluted tubule only 5 to 10 percent that is in very minor amount so if there is problem in the uh, in mainly in the uh, trp m6 uh, gene mutation in so mainly if there will be uh, pro, if there is like problem in this mutation so once the child is having uh, rich magnesium diet also then then also will not be like to maintain he will not be able to maintain the magnesium because of the less absorption so to maintain the absorption we need to give supra physiological dose so here we have uh, sent further evaluation for further evaluation the genetics screening has been sent here we can see the uh, for child compound heterozygous positive for the trpm6 mutation and subsequently for parents we have sent the uh, genetic test uh, heterozygous carrier of one of the variant both par parent both the parent so what is our diagnosis intestinal hypomagnesemia one also known as hypomagnesemia with secondary hypocalcemia also known as hss so treatment given magnesium sulfate uh, that uh, 40 mg per kg per dose 6 hourly for first 24 uh, first 24 hours as there was low magnesium to make the child seizure free first 24 hours we have given this magnesium then again we switch to oral magnesium that is elemental magnesium uh, magnesium in the uh, magnesium oxide that is 50 mg per kg per day but still we there was inadequate serum level of magnesium so we hike this magnesium to 90 mg per kg per day the oral calcium supplementation and the, could be discharged in a stable condition as the child magnesium level is remain stable we we have discharged our child in five days of hospital stay. so something something uh, familial hypomagnesemia with secondary hypocalcemia familial hypomagnesemia with secondary hypocalcemia is a rare autosomal recessive disorder characterized by very low serum magnesium level hypocalcemia is secondary due to parathyroid failure, parathyroid resistance due to severe low magnesium, typically manifest during the first months of life with generalized convulsion of signs of increased neuromuscular excitability like muscle spasm or titani. If untreated, disease may be fatal or lead to severe neurological damage. Treatment includes immediate administration of magnesium, usually intravenous, then lifelong oral magnesium supplementation. So in follow-up, the child is seizure-free now, no muscle spasm either. Take home message from this case, hypocalcemia is an important and treatable cause of, for infantile seizure. In a case of hypocalcemia, it is very important to rule out hypomagnesemia. A physiologic response to hypocalcemia is increased in PTH, but if PTH is low, one needs to exclude endocrine cause as well as hypomagnesemia. Uh, renal and GI losses are commonest cause of hypomagnesemia. In its absence, possibility of defect in the gatekeeper should be considered. If intestinal hypomagnesemia is diagnosed, high dose lifelong oral magnesium should be continued. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shubhati, for the wonderful presentation. Uh, the session is now open for discussion and questions, if any. Yes, uh, it's a wonderful case. Thank you very much, uh, Shubhati. Uh, I was wondering that actually, uh, uh, familial would be a diagnosis by exclusion. Is it right? Yes. I mean, was there a family history? Why did you come to the conclusion of familial? Or uh, did you look up into other possible causes, even though it may be very rare? This itself is a very rare entity. Sir, in the clinical presentation, the child was initially uh, worked up in previous hospitals also. So they, mm -hmm. they have given the magnesium supplementation, but still the child is not able to hold the magnesium properly. So, I think it was refractory hypomagnesemia at that point of time. It was refractory to treatment. I, uh, I, uh, can you hear me? Am I audible? Uh, it was just, uh, can you repeat the question, sir, once? I'm just asking, I mean, uh, familial, uh, coming to the diagnosis or conclusion of familial hypomagnesemia, it will, it will basically be a diagnosis of exclusion. So, can uh, we look into the other rare possible causes? I think uh, this is a diagnosis okay. which is yeah. been proven by the genetic test. Hypomagnesemia okay. 1 intestinal is hypomagnesemia. intestinal uh, hypomagnesemia 1 
is essentially a condition where you cannot absorb magnesium well. And that is mm -hmm. why this child had the serum magnesium as 0.5 and came to us almost after a year and a half of suffering recurrent seizures. And the seizures occurred because the magnesium levels were low. In Oregon yeah. Institute, they did detect that the magnesium was low and PTH was low. But they gave some IV cap, uh, magnesium, oral uh, magnesium at standard doses and sent them on. Here we got the genetic test done. And also, as Shubhradeep showed, that the parents were also studied and both the parents had one of the genetic uh, mutations. So that is why it okay. is indeed okay. familiar. Okay. Fine. And that, that's the second thing. Okay. And the so, third so thing you, could get, you, you could get into the genetic genetic test done. That was great. That's no, great. That, is, okay. that is the USP okay. of this case. I think that's, that, concludes, yeah, that concludes the story then. That makes it up. Okay. Thanks for your question. Thank you. Any further questions? Or else um, yeah, I'm just interested I, 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 to know. Just, just, yeah, please. I, I'd like to have just, just one more to, Sorry, sorry. Orinda, go ahead. I can, just one more thing. Uh, you've got to give the uh, magnesium lifelong, number one. And what would be the dose? I, it could be quite heavy doses, or could you reduce the dose later on? The dose uh, was at 90 milligram per kilogram of elemental magnesium. And that will was... continue for life? Well, for now, he's continuing. There is no other, uh, you know, avenue. What they were doing, they used to get a shot of I, I am magnesium every month or so, every time the child started getting jittery. But now we have a diagnosis. And now, like many other diseases which are difficult to treat, we have to stay with this high-dose medicine, just like you have, you know, uh, refractory rickets and they have to take medication all their lives. Uh, just as Sir said, it is uh, actually very much similar to refractory rickets in a way because uh, magnesium is absorbed in two ways from the gut. One is via the TRPM 6 and 7, which is an active process, and there's a passive paracellular process. This very high dose basically bypasses the active absorption mechanism, and the high luminal content of magnesium in intestine will basically aid in the paracellular absorption. That is how it works, the high dose oral magnesium. Shushmita ma'am wanted something. It's okay. I think uh, the next question has also been um, addressed in the chat box. We have always found it very difficult to get magnesium supplements. But apparently you have been able to find it. Ma uh, Mavignon. It's called, is Ma it, is Mag -Vion. It's called Mag Mag Vion. Vion. And yeah, uh, what, what tablet? It's how many? Oxide. And how many milligrams? Milligram. 500 milligrams. So 400 milligrams. Yeah. 400 milligrams. Okay. And is there any explanation uh, behind why the absorption defect only affects the intestine and not the kidney? Uh, yes. Uh, basically, what happens is uh, the absorption defect in intestine is uh, explanatory, which I just said. Now, in the kidney, this channel is located in the distal convoluted tubule. Now, before coming to DCT, uh, around 85% of magnesium is already absorbed first by the PCT and then by the thick ascending loom or limb of the uh, loop of Henley. The magnesium already uh, gets absorbed mostly. So the final urinary magnesium concentration is not so much dependent on the TRP M6 defect, which will be there on the DCT and not on the PCT or in the loop of Henley. Thank you. That's very interesting. Thank you. So uh, with your due permission, I would like to move on to our next, next presenter. Dr. Adri Lakshmi Pravalika is our uh, third year DNB trainee uh, and she will be uh, speaking about our next case. I will just give me, allow me a moment to share the screen for her. There are a few more questions in the chat box. We'll address those questions at the end of the session for the interest of time. Thank you. 
you can also keep answering in the chat box sure ma'am sure ma'am okay good afternoon today it's a honor for me to present in this prestigious uh, west bengal iip meeting thank you sir for giving me this opportunity now today my title is on do not judge a book by its cover as we all know it's a well known metaphorical phrase that one should not decide the worth or value of anything by its external appearance now let us know why is it so introduction this is a case of 8 months old female child presented to our emergency with a history of vomiting for the last 3 days and she was born of a non consanguineous marriage she also had a history of clear to drive the child was not gaining weight for the last 3 months with repeated episodes of vomiting and gradual darkening of skin as noted by parents were documented for the last 3 months there was a developmental delay as there was a poor neck control at 8 months of age This was the photo at presentation to our emergency, and uh, this is the photo taken three months back of a similar kid with a fair complexion. Past history suggested that the child was hospitalized fifteen days back with similar complaints, where she was conservatively treated and was discharged on resolution of symptoms and was referred to a pediatric endocrinologist, as the report in the Howard Hospital suggested hyponatremia, hyperkalemia, and the low bicarbonate was on the lower side. the management which she received in the outside hospital were iv fluids kvin sated syrup no doses and in the view of failure to thrive along with developmental delay whole whole exam sequencing was sent from that hospital at presentation in our emergency the examination was conducted and the examination findings revealed that the child was tachycardic tachypneic maintaining saturations in room hair blood pressure was on the lower side and dehydration was present systemic examinations were within normal limits and she was having a normal female genitalia blood report done on the day of admission showed hyperkalemia hyponatremia and hypercalcemia post in our hospital immediately an iv access was secured a blood gas was done which showed metabolic acidosis hyponatremia hyperkalemia and hypercalcemia In view of such a blood gas with features of dehydration, NS bolus at a rate 20 ml per kg was instituted, and hyperkalemic management was started. An urgent early ECG was done to see any ECG changes associated with hyperkalemia, and in the absence of these ECG changes and hyperkalemia documented in the blood gas, calcium gluconate was not used. Instead, insulin glucose was started along with sodium bicarbonate infusion, as she was also having acidosis with hyperkalemia. This was the VBG done at uh, admission, which is showing metabolic acidosis and electrolyte disturbances, and it was normalized after 12 hours of uh, starting the treatment. And the potassium uh, came from 7.96 to 4.24, and uh, but the sodium was on the lower side. By then, OPD reports done just two days back showed a low cortisol level of 1.6 microgram per deciliter and increased ACTH level of 2,000 picograms per milliliter and a low aldosterone level of 3.6 nanogram per deciliter. And hence, a provisional diagnosis of Addisonian crisis due to hypoadrenalism was made. With the help of our pediatric endocrinologist, Dr. Shubhrato De, definitive management was initiated immediately. Injection hydrocortisone was started at uh, 100 mg per meter square in three divided doses, which was then gradually tapered to 50 mg per meter square by 24 hours and was transitioned to oral by 36 to 48 hours. Tap hydrocortisone was also added after oral feeding was established. Extra oral su all supplementation was done when IV fluids were tapered off. These were the blood investigations trained in our hospital, and um, within four days of admission, all the electrolyte imbalances were corrected. But on day three of admission, we could find a small mass in the inguinal region for which imaging studies were done. USC pelvis done showed no uterus or ovarian structure, but there were two small masses in the inguinal region, likely testicular structure. So MRI of pelvis was done, which also showed the similar result. There was uh, uterus absence of uterus and ovaries, and uh, 
presence of a gonadal structure at bilateral inguinal canal. So a karyotaping rip uh, was sent. Finally, the child was discharged on day four of admission and she was on full oral feed with no electrolyte imbalances and was gaining weight adequately. A few weeks after discharge, the karyotypic report has come, which was abnormal. That is, the child was having a 46XY karyotype, hence justifying my title. So, this is a kid of eight months old female child <coughs> presenting in Edisonian crisis due to congenital adrenal hyperplasia, resulting in disorders of sexual differentiation with 46XY karyotype. This was our final diagnosis. But can one, anyone guess that which type of CAH presents with uh, genotypic males, but which are phenotypic females? The genetics has provided the answer. We got it from the whole exome sequence report that it showed lipodal congenital adrenal hyperplasia was the one which is caused by star mutation on axon 5. It is uh, having autosomal recessive inheritance and it is pathogenic. So let us know what is all about STAR. This is the steroidogenesis pathway, of course, which is a, one of the complex pathway for one to memorize. So STAR stands for steroidogenic acute regulatory protein. This is the premier step which helps in conversion of cholesterol to pregnenolone. If a STAR mutation is present, then the cycle does not, does not continue and results in low aldosterone, cortisol and sex hormones. Now, a few lines of congenital lipodal adrenal hyperplasia. Lipodal CH is the most difficult form of CH. As we know, it disrupts the adrenal and gonadal steroidogenesis. Most cause of C lipodal CH are caused by recessive mutation due to mut mutation of star protein. The star protein is the weight limiting step in steroidogenesis and it helps in the transport of cholesterol from outer to the inner mitochondrial membrane. Affected patients suffer with severe adrenal failure in our early infancy, and these are genotypic males, but are phenotypic females due to disrupted testicular androgen secretion. This is the table showing summarizing the effects in the steroidogenesis as our, kid, as our child was having lipoidal CH and, uh, and she is a female with no sexual development, and the, all the steroid products are on the lower side. This is the recent picture of the kid and she's an, on regular follow-up with our endocrinologist and she's now 16 months old, developmentally progressing well. As she had a poor neck control at admission at eight months, now she can sit without support and stand with support. However, all the social and language milestones were normal. Plan was to remove the gonads at two years of age and she would be reared as a female child. Okay. Uh, see in this picture how is she looking like one uh, in the in the initial slide which we have shown she had a skin darkening but now she is very fair <laughs> her message so history and clinical examination is still relevant in today's world of genetics and genomics Metabolic acidosis presenting with hyponatremia and hypokalemia should always rule out any adrenal cause apart from renal causes. Edisonian crisis is a life-threatening condition which requires prompt treatment by timely diagnosis and intervention and cause of which should be found. Thank you. I once again thank Dr. Shubhrata Dey for giving me a chance to present this one of the rare cases. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pravalika, for that wonderful presentation. Um, Dr. Basudev Patra has already mentioned in the chat box that this case proves that the metabolic and endocrine screening is absolutely mandatory, especially in the newborn period. Yes, sir, we completely agree with you. Uh, and, uh, uh, to... can, I, can I have a question here? I mean, very related yes, to sir, Dr. Basudev Patra's question. I mean, the usual screening which we do for CH among the usual six yeah. diseases which include G6PD, galactosemia, CH, phenylketone, urea, and blah, blah, blah. Uh, would this entity would also be picked up? No, no, sir. No, sir. The reason is that the, the, what is picked up is 21 hydrostylase deficiency, which is uh, translates as 17 OHP elevation. It is the step. If you want to show that uh, slide? Yes. It is that step between pregnenolone and uh, sorry, 
17 hydroxy progesterone, as you can see here, to 11 deoxycortisol. This is where yes. the 21 hydroxylase enzyme works. You see this? Hmm. And that is why this is raised. And that is why then the reaction goes to the right and you have a virilization. And because it doesn't progress here further as well, you have mineral corticoid deficiency. So the short answer is no, because when this is at this level, everything will be low. And both pregnenolone, 17 hydroxy pregnenolone, uh, 17 hydroxy progesterone, progesterone, everything will be low. So it won't get picked up. We have another question from Dr. Devaditto, and he has asked about the cause of hypercalcemia in this patient. Was it due to dehydration or was it due to acidosis. adrenal it insufficiency? Was, it was due to acidosis. Thank you. Are there any other questions or we will move on to our next presentation? Uh, before that, can I tell something? Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Uh, okay, okay. Uh, we have, uh, this is just a short announcement that uh, on Saturday afternoon at uh, 2 o'clock, we do have a PG masterclass on uh, uh, congenital heart diseases, uh, the way to approach. And also in that day, in the afternoon, in the evening, at 8 o'clock, we do have the Legends program uh, on pediatric orthopedics and surgery. Please do join us on that same day. Please carry on. Carry Thank on, please. Thank you so much, sir, for that uh, very useful information, especially for PG teaching. I would like to invite our next speaker, if there are no further questions, with your due permission. Yes, sir. Chantri, go ahead. Huh? Yes, ma'am. Uh, I, I need to mute yeah. the mic. Yeah. Share screen, Jacob. I need this first. Yeah. yeah, I need to close this PPT first. Coach. Fourth. Yeah. And I need to go to the Zoom just a second. Yes. Next up is Dr. Ali Mohan with uh, a very unusual uh, couple of cases, actually. Welcome, Dr. Ali. Good afternoon, everyone. Myself, Dr. Ali Mohan, second year DNB trainee. Thank you for this opportunity to present. As doctors, we are taught when you hear hoof beats, think horses, not zebras. I feel extremely privileged to present before you an interesting case where the hoof beats were actually zebras. Here are two girls who were cousins who presented to pediatric endocrinology OPD with similar complaints at around the same age. The first child presented with high blood sugars. In June 2018, there is significant family history. She was born out of consanguineous marriage. She had three siblings, two are doing fine. One with similar complaints had expired. Development while she was normal. The second child also presented with high blood sugars and diabetic ketoacidosis. She was a cousin of the former. She presented two years later in April 2021. Development-wise, normal. General examination revealed mild pallor. There were no syndromic facies, and systemic examination was normal. In the first child, weight for age and height for age were in normal limits. The second child was underweight. 
routine diabetic workup was done, which showed raised blood sugars and raised HbA1c, and serum C peptide was low. Treatment for diabetes was initiated with subcutaneous insulin and dietary modifications. In view of anemia, we did complete hemogram also, which showed similar blood picture in both the children with low hemoglobin, low RBC count, whereas mean corpuscular volume was found to be increased. Peripheral smear examination showed anisocytosis with macrocytes and normocytes. So red cell indices and peripheral smear were suggestive of macrocytic anemia, and we did a workup of macrocytic anemia. Now here is the catch. The serum vitamin B12 and serum folate were found to be in the normal limits. Serum ferritin was also normal. So we have a case of macrocytic anemia with normal levels of vitamin B12 and serum folate and diabetes. Early onset diabetes mellitus along with macrocytic anemia raised suspicion about monogenic diabetes or a genetic syndrome and that's how we did a genetic study. Targeted gene sequencing of genes causing monogenic diabetes was done using Illumina sequencing platform and a novel homozygous mutation in exon 4 of SLC1982 gene was found. Now, this particular mutation would result into a stop codon and results in premature truncation of a protein involved in intracellular thiamine uptake. The corresponding phenotype is thiamine responsive megaloblastic anemia syndrome, TRMA syndrome, also known as Roger syndrome. Review of literature showed that there is excellent treatment outcome with therapeutic doses of oral thiamine and the child was started on oral thiamine at 50 mg once daily. Surveillance investigations were done for hearing and eye examination and were found to be normal. Let us see the response to treatment. In the first child, as soon as diabetes was diagnosed, we started on subcutaneous insulin therapy and the insulin requirement was escalating. After we got the report of genetic study, we started her on thiamine supplementation on 2nd August to be precise. And if you notice, ever since thiamine has started, there was a con consistent drop in the daily insulin requirement and the child became insulin independent by November, which was three months later three months after the onset of thiamine therapy. In the second child, we started with thiamine therapy at the outset itself, and she also became euglycemic within two months, and both the children continue to be euglycemic. And regarding anemia, anemia resolved, as is evident from the follow-up investigations done after three months, hemoglobin increased, mean corpuscular volume normalized, and macrocytes disappeared. Now, thiamine response in megaloblastic anemia, also known as Rogers syndrome, was first described by Dr. Lon Rogers in 1969. It's an autosomal recessive disorder characterized by a triage, megaloblastic anemia, diabetes mellitus, and sensory neural hearing loss. It is exceedingly rare out here consanguineous marriages. Till date, only 100 cases have been identified worldwide. Diabetes and anemia can resolve with therapeutic doses of thiamine, which is 50 to 75 mg per day, and this is quite a high dose. If you remember, the RD of thiamine is 1.5 mg per day. And hearing loss associated with the syndrome is irreversible, may not be prevented by thiamine supplementation. Other clinical presentations include optic atrophy, cardiovascular abnormalities, and neurologic defect like stroke and epilepsy has also been observed in selected subsets. Differential diagnosis include myelodysplastic syndrome because of similar bone marrow picture in both. Phenotypic overlaps exist between Wolfram syndrome and Pearson syndrome, and genetic testing helps to clinch the diagnosis in such phenotypic overlaps. Coming to the molecular pathogenesis, SLC 1982 gene codes for high affinity thiamine transporter, THPR, which is involved in intracellular transport of thiamine. Any defect in this particular protein would result into reduced intracellular thiamine resulting into defective RNA ribosynthesis, resulting into megaloblastic changes in RBC, defects in insulin secretion, and selective loss of inner higher cells of cochlea. An important research area in TRMA disease pathogenesis is, why are the findings in TRMA organ specific? Why are there no manifestations of dietary thiamine deficiency like we see in Berberi? Studies in mouse models have shown that there's another high affinity thiamine transporter, which is en encoded by another gene, SLC19A3, which has a major role in industrial thiamine uptake. Furthermore, the expression of genes are varied across various tissues. 
And with the postulated that expression of SLC-1982 is much higher in pancreatic endocrine cells, bone marrow, and cochlear cells, resulting to their involvement in Rogers syndrome. A diagnosis of TRMA is made when megaloblastic anemia coexists with normal vitamin B12 or folate levels with or without diabetes or hearing loss, and there is response to oral thiamine. Alternatively, identification of biallelic pathogenic variants in SLC1982 by molecular genetic testing clinches the diagnosis. Management, the definitive treatment is lifelong therapy with pharmacologic doses of oral thiamine. Uh, complications secondary to poor glycemic control or anemia have to be looked for and managed. Surveillance is important to look for efficacy of oral thiamine therapy and to look for the disease progression. So yearly complete hemogram assessment of glucose intolerance and hearing ophthalmologic and cardiac evaluation is recommended. Before I wind up, a word about monogenic diabetes. It's a rare type of diabetes caused by mutation to a single gene, different from type one or type two diabetes, which are polygenic. Genetic testing can give accurate diagnosis, can modify outcome by refining management like we see in our index case. Two main clinical phenotypes are neonatal diabetes and maturity onset diabetes in young. There are a number of genes implicated in monogenic diabetes and as you can see, SLC1982 is a rare cause of monogenic diabetes. Of note, I would like to stress upon the importance of genetic testing in diabetes because gene direct management can improve outcome. It alerts the physician of non-pancreatic features and also helps to identify the risk family members. And the most important question, when to do genetic testing in diabetes? It is recommended in all children with diabetes onset before six months of age, in children with negative pancreatic autoantibodies like GARD65, and diabetes when accompanied by other non-pancreatic features suggestive of a syndrome. With this, I conclude. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ali, for the extensive, elaborate presentation. Now we are happy to take questions. Can I ask a simple question? I mean, I, I, did I miss it? Uh, was there any hearing issues in this uh, in these children? Thank you, sir, for this question. Uh, this child was tested with uh, Vera, and it was found to be negative. So there was no hearing no. issues involved. Uh, yeah, there were no uh, hearing issues so far, but it is. Uh, in literature shows that it can uh, thiamine supplementation cannot prevent the uh, onset of uh, sensory neural hearing loss. So close follow up is recommended. Fine. Thank you. Uh, any more questions? Uh, that was such a fabulous case. We are all struck down. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, may I please request our audience members to kindly mute, mute the mics, please. The ones who are asking questions are most welcome to. Otherwise, the background noise is a little bit distracting. One thought, did both the, uh, again, you might have uh, mentioned it, did both the patients present to your institute or was one uh, just uh, the details were taken by history from the index case. Both these patients have presented to our institute uh, in a temporarily spaced out manner, definitely. One presented earlier and one later. Right. But they so easily could not have. They could have made, uh, attended different institutes, which makes the point of a very detailed history taking so important. Yes. It could have just Okay, shall we continue? Sure, ma'am. Thank you for the wonderful uh, discussion and interaction. Uh, we would progress to our next presentation. And it, the presenter is Dr. Sandeep Samuel, who is a final year DNB trainee at Apollo Multi Specialty Hospitals. And he is going to talk about tigers and dragons. And his presentation is on crouching tiger and hidden dragon. Over to Sandeep. It's a Chinese proverb, actually. Why it has been named so is 
uh, yeah, it will be divulged at the end. Uh, Sandeep, over to you. Stand a little back. <clears throat> Respected teachers, good afternoon all. Today I'm going to present a case which we named as Crouching Tiger and Hidden Tiger. Let us see the details of the case. A 14-year-old girl came with chief complaints of swelling of both lower limbs from last one month, abdominal distension from last 10 days, severe abdominal pain along with vomiting from last five days. For the same complaint, child has been admitted in a local hospital where she suffered an episode of cardiac arrest following an episode of vomiting, probably due to aspiration. Child was revived, intubated, kept on inotropes and referred to our hospital for further management. Child had a history of a uh, child recently started dieting and exercising excessively, which led to weight loss of around 31 kgs in the last five months, for which they consulted a psychiatrist diagnosed as a case of anorexia nervosa and medication has been started. Child attained menarche at the age of 11 years. Cycles were regular and lasting for five days. But she did not have menstruation from last six months. As I said, child is on a diet where she was specifically taking oats, ragi, apples and warm water. There is no need of similar complaints in the family. On initial examination, child is looking sick, cachectic, and intubated. Vitals are like child is euglycemic, eudermic, tachycardic, tachypnic, maintaining saturations on PS CPAP mode of ventilation. Her weight is 34 kg, lost around 48% of weight in last five months. And BMI is 13.2 kg per meter square. On systemic exam. Can I, can I interrupt your on the presenter view? Can you go to the audience view of your uh, slide presentation? Is it possible? Otherwise, don't worry. Hi. I think you have to change the, uh, if you go to one of those display settings or taskbar, you have to change screens. Uh, leave it, leave it. No, it's not working. Leave it. Come on, Sandeep. On systemic examination, child was having bilateral crepitations, presence of gallop rhythm along with normal heart sounds, abdominal distension more in the epigastric and umbilical region. On initial management, after evaluation of respiratory status, as the support was minimal, we extubated the child on the same day and kept on with the fancy and child tolerated well. As features of congestive cardiac failure were noted, echocardiography was done, where cardiac dysfunction was noted with ejection fraction of around 30%. We started the child on infusion dobutamine and injection less. As features of intestinal obstruction were there, we kept the child kneel by mouth and we are replacing bilious NJ aspirate with RL and CECT abdomen was planned. And we started correcting the metabolic abnormalities like hypokalemia, hypophosphatemia, hypomagnesemia, hypocalcemia. These are the initial investigations on day of admission. The child was having anemia with hemoglobin of 7.6 gram percentage and hypokalemia, hypophosphatemia, hypocalcemia, hypomagnesemia and elevated levels of urea. Child has elevated levels of CRP and procalcitonin. Test X-ray showed bilateral atelectasis with pleural effusion. As I said, echocardiography showed severe LV dysfunction with ejection fraction of around 30%. So initially, based on the history, clinical presentation, and radiological findings, we suspected TB. And extensive workup was done for the same. Sputum, pleural fluid, acetic fluid, everything came negative for TB basically. Health condition deteriorated further. Work of breathing increased along with oxygen requirement. Repeat test X-ray showed bilateral pneumonia with features of early ARDS. So we kept the child on BiPAP. Bronchoscopy was done. Dial fluid showed positive for galactomenin and culture showed MDR acinetobacter. So culture sensitive antibiotics and antifungals were started with regular physiotherapy and frequent posture change, slow improvement notice and uh, BiPAP gradually changed to nasal prong oxygen and then to room air. 
these are the series of chest x-rays of the child during the hospital stay now what was causing intestinal obstruction for the child initially we did an ultrasound abdomen which showed overtly distended stomach with dilated small bowel loops tct abdomen was done which showed matting of small bowel loops and decreased iotomesenteric angle a gastrographic study was done which showed narrowing of third part of the duodenum because the history clinical presentation and radiological features diagnosis of smes syndrome was made what was smes syndrome when we see the anatomical course of superior mesenteric artery it originates from the abdominal aorta behind the first part of the duodenum and passes in front of the third part of the duodenum where it originates from the abdominal aorta it makes an angle which is known as iotomesenteric angle which is normally around 45 degrees due to rapid weight loss the fat pad which is surrounding the blood vessels is lost which decreases this iotomesenteric angle when it decreases below 28 degrees it causes compression of the third part of the duodenum which causes obstruction to the passage of the food which causes features of intestinal obstruction the treatment is with weight restoration as we see weight restoration is the key part of the treatment but we are we are having many challenges in this child like gastroparesis sma syndrome villus atrophy due to prolonged starvation and when once we start the feeds there is always a possibility of refeeding syndrome so multidisciplinary approach is needed in this case we have to hike up the calories gradually over several days in a phased manner with prompt correction of metabolic abnormalities so initially trophic feeding was started to ng2 but chi but child didn't tolerate it so total parenteral nutrition was started else slowly started gaining weight we repeated the gastrographic study this time i reached the large intestine so ng feeds restarted and this time child tolerated well gradually ng feeds changed to oral form we formulated a diet plan where we started with 1500 kilo calorie diet and 50 grams of protein increased 300 kilo calories every 3 to 4 days with prompt correction of uh, electrolyte abnormality is done we continued this process till child receive child is able to tolerate 2400 kilo calorie diet and 90 grams of protein this is the overview of the management on day 1 child presented with intestinal obstruction on day 2 radiological investigations were done on day 4 trophic feedings were started but child couldn't tolerate so we did a gastrographic study which showed narrowing of the duodenum on day 6 we started total parenteral nutrition and continued till day 22 we repeated gastrographic study where uh, this time di reached the large intestine so we restarted the feeds and child is able to tolerate the feeds and we reached full feeds by day 38 and we were able to discharge the child on day 44 psychiatric evaluation was done once after initial stabilization diagnosis of anorexia nervosa was confirmed and medication was started before discharge reevaluation was done and antidepressants were added hospital stay was further complicated by sepsis and deep vein thrombosis for which culture sensitive antibiotics and low molecular weight heparin was start was given so before discharge chest x ray showed bilaterally well expanded lungs and the child is able to tolerate 2400 kilo calorie diet with 90 grams of protein so we discharged the child with a diagnosis of anorexia nervosa with multi organ dysfunction nosocomial blood stream infection nosocomial pneumonia sma syndrome and severe dyselectrolemia anorexia nervosa is a condition which character which is characterized by significantly low body weight with intense fear of gaining slightest amount of weight and with distorted view of body it occurs in two forms restrictive form binge eating and purging form severity of anorexia nervosa is based on the bmi anorexia nervosa can present wide variety of medical complications here in our case we dealt with medical complications like bradycardia and hypotension congestive cardiac failure acute gastric dilatation delayed gastric emptying sma syndrome 
endocrine like amenorrhea hypophosphatemia hypomagnesemia hypokalemia and aspirational pneumonia with the help of multidisciplinary approach we were able to tackle all the challenges thrown at us and we were able to discharge the child who came in a moribund state here are the photographs of the child one during the hospital stay and another during the follow up these are the take home messages from this case rapid weight loss especially in adolescents eating disorders should always be kept in mind apart from chronic infectious states malignancy and malignancy nutrition is the key treatment for anorexia nervosa anorexia nervosa can present with wide variety of medical complications which can present as a primary issue and one needs to be vigilant in recognizing them most medical problems reverse with crucial nutritional rehabilitation and weight restoration multidisciplinary approach is needed while treating anorexia nervosa thank you thank you sandeep for the insight into this uh, into this presentation which was quite difficult to actually manage in the beginning uh, we are open for questions you can ask us directly or in the chat box i have a very simple question i mean uh, when was this was this during these covid times yes sir this incident yes sir uh, during covid times sir so one i mean uh, considering a background it is definitely possible that the child was gaining weight because of inactivity overeating during the early periods of covid being at home and then suddenly felt into this psychiatric issues of going into an induced weight loss program yes sir it's always so that, a possibility that, that but possibility. well in any case a great, great a wonderful case and well managed thank you thank you sir from similar lines my comment would be that it's amazing that she reached such an extreme state before the parents uh, seek medical attention uh, i assume they come from a reasonably good socio economic background uh, so it seems just really dire that uh, you know she would come in this state is it do you think it's because of this covid situation again that uh, people were so unwilling to come and to hospitals etc uh kind of ma'am actually the father used to stay outside for business and he was stuck there due to covid and the mother uh, actually is uh, was a homemaker with not uh, much uh, idea about uh, what to do on her own and to take the child on her own to hospital so these issues were definitely there thank you sandeep for your so ma'am may we proceed yes please You didn't tell us the reason for the caption, Sandeep. Please explain your caption. You said you will say at the end. You said the problem is the title, it is the mind. The hidden dragon is the is the body. Uh, ma'am uh, there are so many medical complications in this child who uh, uh, which are always uh, pouncing at us but the main hidden dragon is always anorexia nervosa and it's a disease of the mind and it's a disease of the mind okay thank you again it is coming in the same way Usually there is a option that you can change screen. Yes, yes. No, no. Give me this one. Ah. Direct slide show. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yes, this is fine. Yes. Ah. Uh, next up are. Uh, closing uh, presenter actually uh, dr arup manazir 
and yeah, last but not the least, Dr. Arup Manazir. Uh, she will be uh, presenting a case where the child's heart was re beating really fast. And uh, Arup is our second year DNB trainee in our program. And I'll welcome Arup to take over. Come. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Today, I'm privileged here to present my case titled as My Heart is Beating Fast. So my case is a male newborn born prematurely at 32 plus 4 weeks by an emergency LSTS. Baby cried spontaneously at birth, mm -hmm. abgas were normal, and the baby was further transferred to NNICU for monitoring in view of the prematurity. Lighting the maternal history, she was a 33-year-old uh, second gravida, known case of Graves' disease, diagnosed in her first trimester, and was currently on methimazole since her second trimester. On examination, she was found to have exaphthalmos, and her last thyroid profile was positive for TSH receptor antibodies. On day one of life, we observed that baby started developing episodes of apnea with heart rate up to 120 beats per minute. The sepsis screening was sent, which later came out to be negative. Caffeine was loaded along with the IV antibiotics and the apnea resolved. On day three, keeping in mind the maternal history and along with the other routine investigations, a thyroid profile was sent, which was as follows. Serum TSH was found to be low, and FT3 and FT4 were normal. So, a pediatric endocrinologist, Dr. Supruta Dev, was consulted, and he advised that we can repeat the investigation after three to four days. But by day six, we observed that baby started developing tachycardia with heart rate up to 180 beats per minute, along with irritability. Injection caffeine was already stopped a day prior. Blood pressure, ECG done was normal, and sepsis was again ruled out. So a thyroid profile with the antibodies level was sent, which was as follow. Serum TSH, again persistent low, FT3 and FT4 shows increasing trends, and antibodies were found to be strongly positive. That clinched us the diagnosis that we are dealing with a case of neonatal Graves' disease that has occurred mainly due to transplacental passage of maternal antibodies. Day seven, treatment was initiated. We looked for, we looked for Lugol's iodine in order to inhibit the release of the already formed hormone. But as it was not available, we started on tablet methimazole at 1 mg per kg per day in two divided doses, along with propanolol at 1.5 mg per kg per day in three divided doses under strict vital monitoring. And baby responded well. Heart rate stabilized in the next 24 hours, and the repeat investigation also showed improving trend. Baby was finally discharged on day 14 with tablet methimazole <laughs> with dose reduced to half and with propanolol was continued at the same at the same dose with heart rate of 150 to 160 beats per minute. This is a pictorial representation of the variation in the heart rate, red uh, arrow marks when the uh, treatment was initiated and you can notice how the heart rate stabilized after that. Follow-up follow investigation after two weeks of discharge showed that serum TSH has risen to 5.5, FT4 and FT3 were further reducing, and the antibodies level were reduced from 31 to 4.9. So, methimazole was stopped and propanolol dose was reduced. Uh, in the next visit, we, pro we tapered propanolol over a period of eight weeks, and by day 90, baby was completely clinically and biochemically new thyroid and was discharged from the follow-ups. These are the pictorial representation of the response to treatment, red arrow marks when the uh, treatment was initiated. And as you can, all can see, by day 28, we had normal level of TSH, FT4, and FT3, followed by tapering of the treatment. So summarizing my case, day 3, baby was asymptomatic, uh, but the TSH was found to be low. Day 6, uh, day six baby developed tachycardia with a deranged thyroid profile and antibodies positive. Day 7, uh, treatment initiated with methimazole and propanolol. Day 14, baby was discharged with the dose of methimazole reduced to half. Day 28, methimazole was stopped and propanolol was further tapered over the next eight weeks. And by day 90, baby was clinically and biochemically euthyroid. Uh, uh, highlighting the fetal thyroid physiology, I would like to highlight the fact that the normal thyroid hormone synthesis of serum TSH, FT4, and FT3 FT starts only by 12 week of gestation. So prior to 12, week, 12 weeks, the fetus is entirely dependent on the maternal transfer of the thyroid hormones. At birth, at birth due to certain stress, there is an acute release of TSH in the, over the next 24 hours with the maximum level within 30 minutes of birth. 
T3 and T4 also surges at 24 to 48 hours of life. Their level ultimately normalizes in the next one to two weeks. Coming to my core, core topic, neonatal graves. It is a rare disease. Nearly all the patients, they have a maternal history of either cured or active graves, mainly occurs due to transplacental passage of antibodies. And the maternal serum titers of the antibodies have to be really high in order to produce these symptoms. And if there is a history that mother is being treated with antithyroid drugs, the onset can be delayed by three to seven days, as seen in our case. And it can remit spontaneously within six to 12 weeks. Then why to treat? Because you can present features of tachycardia, which can lead to heart failure, features of hyperthermia, irritability, diarrhea, that can lead to poor weight gain. Coming uh, to the treatment, in the treatment, we basically want to control three steps. That is the synthesis of the hormone, release of the hormone, and the peripheral conversion. In order to control the first step, that is the synthesis, we use a class of drug called Comites that includes methimazole. Methimazole mainly acts by inhibiting the en enzyme thyroid peroxidase, which is required for the process of uh, oxidation, organification, and the couplic reaction in order for the synthesis of T3, T4. Second step, that is the release of the hormone, is inhibited by iodides. Iodides are the fastest acting agent and are also known as thyroid constipating agents. The peripheral conversion is inhibited by beta blockers and to some extent by theomide. Take home message, all the pregnant mothers who are diagnosed with Graves' disease should have regular antenatal checkups with periodic thyroid screening. Treatment should be initiated as early and as possible in suspected cases of neonatal Graves, and antithyroid medication should be titrated carefully in order to prevent hypothyroidism, and neurocognitive development should be monitored during follow-up. This is, uh, thank you, and this is the baby currently, around five months uh, and off the thyroid drugs and gaining weight adequately. Thank you. Really, all, all the cases have been really good. Uh, can I just, uh, I mean, uh, the child, the mother had grace with the exophthalmos was an antithyroid medication. Yes, with a TSH of 0 0.005, I think it was, in the first case itself, the first attempt. So, I mean, with that very low TSH, would that justify starting off therapy then and there, despite there being not much of symptoms? So actually, the maternal uh, history was not very clear. Actually, in, in the initial part, they were consulting some Ayurvedic doctors and they were inappropriately treated. No, but uh, uh, your history says that uh, there was exophthalmos. You mentioned that in red. And uh, you also mentioned the child was on uh, antithyroid medications at that point of time. <laughs> Uh, uh, allow me to answer that. Yes, as you noticed, Dr. Mangalik, that on day three, that is the time when we routinely do thyroid tests. And in this case, of course, because the mother was clearly Graves' disease with exophthalmos. But the issue is she was treated adequately, uh, as we could see from the prescriptions. And her, if you saw her thyroid labs, the TSH can be suppressed for a very long time. It takes time for it to rebound. In this baby, it's the same thing. At day three, the FT3 and FT4 were normal. Yes, the TSH was suppressed, but the baby was not symptomatic. And so we decided to repeat it because oftentimes mothers who are on treatment, the babies develop their symptoms a little later, as Aru had shown in one of her slides. So we waited for about, you know, six days. But at that point, the baby did show symptoms. We started, we repeated the labs and started the treatment. The response was very, very, you know, effective. The main, the main thing one has, one has to take care is that this is a self-limiting disease and you should have Lugol's ID available when you have a mother who comes with uh, I think Dr. they have answered the question but uh, I was only yeah. wondering you, yeah. no, no, no. let me just uh, just give two very important uh, messages uh, one is 
it is self-limiting, so we can wait if they're not symptomatic. But on the other hand, they can present with severe, you know, thyrotoxicosis in an untreated mother or partly, partially treated. And in those situations, we should be prepared with Lugol's iodine because sometimes it is not available readily. And as Aru has very elegantly described the entire case, that the drug methibazole could be withdrawn after four weeks and the propranol after 12 weeks. And at this point, the baby is perfectly fine out of the woods and we had to monitor very carefully. There was a combined effort of the neonatologists and you know myself, as well as the rest of our, you know, our pediatric consultant. So all in all, this was a very successful outcome of a baby who could have been you know, easily uh, much sicker than uh, anticipated. So thank you all uh, for Shubhra, a very patient question. hearing. Shubhra, that quick question to you. Can sure. you advise us regarding the the appropriate treatment of the mother? Because some of the antithyroid drugs cross the placenta and are contraindicated, right? They are teratogenic, while some right. are safe. Maybe you could right. tell us a few words about that. Yeah, yeah, sure. See, basic thing is uh, there are two drugs. Uh, one is uh, uh, propyl thyroid and the other one is methimazole. Now, PTU is not has been banned in children in the U.S. And we are very, very reluctant to use PTAs in babies. In the mother, you can use either, but oftentimes, uh, PP, I mean, sorry, PTU is a preferred drug. And also, it has a, you know, a shorter half-life. So you can uh, withdraw or escalate PTU doses pretty quickly. Now, the issue, of course, in this case was she had florid graves, was never picked up. The graves was pre, uh, you know, preceding the uh, pregnancy. And during the pregnancy, one general practitioner actually started thyronom because any thyroid disease of pregnancy, they think you give thyronom. I mean, it was a big shocker. But very, very, uh, you know, thankfully they went to a right doctor one of our adult uh, competent endocrinologists, and then things are brought under control. So the answer, the Sushmita, is most endocrinologists prefer PTU because neomarcosol may, in the first trimester, have some teratogenic effects, although that's all theoretical, but uh, PTU should not be used in children. So, thank you, thank you Shabratada. Can yeah. I call upon the judges? Have you uh, completed uh, your yeah. assessment? Will you talk to each other and uh, announce the first and second cases? <laughs> Indranil, are you here? Indranil, if you could coordinate. Okay. Dr. Mangali? Can you off the video? I just wanted to mention to all of you that we have a, this hybrid model has worked. We have a full house in our auditorium. All of you are familiar with our auditorium. So if I... That really, can you show us the audience? Because this is the way we want to go forward for the yes. history. Yeah. Yes. Uh, <laughs> hey, I'm the IT go better. You want to go <laughs> I can move the camera a little bit, it will be visible. I know, but we have to move the whole laptop. That's it. <laughs> okay. The two fearless uh, girls and smiling. Yeah. That's a full house. Hello. Hello. Hey. Yeah. Ah, hello. Oh, well, the judges have given their report. Hello. Yes, the, judges right. has, the judges, they have given their reports. Uh, so presenter number four is the first. This is Ali Mohan. 
Yeah. Mohan is number four. This is uh, when you hear the sound of hoofs, think zebras. Big hand to yes. And I must add. Congratulations. That... She talked on time. Thank you very much, sir. And this. And uh, second Indra is the number one presenter. Second is number one presenter. Number one is Dr. Devajyoti Mukhopadhyay. The king is unleashed. Okay. So one uh, so... very rare pre presentation uh, and one rare presentation of a common illness. Common disease, yeah. <laughs> Great. Congratulations. Well done. So how we'll will they get you, the certificate? We'll send you the certificates. Uh, we'll send you the certificate shortly. And uh, uh, also, uh, I mean, uh, we are going to start a middle system, as our president has said. Uh, that may be given during the uh, Peticon, annual Peticon, that we will discuss and send it to you. Excellent. Thank you very much. Well, uh, the, you attendance, very much, the attendance was over 60 people. How much was the attendance? No, sir, it was uh, 54. 56. I failed seven, uh, 54, yeah, 56, yes. 56. I was uh, four short of my target. Uh, I was four short of my target because uh, every uh, WBAP clinical meet only 10% increase in, I mean, lab goers, snap goers in the afternoon, they get into the system. So I think after five to six uh, WBAP uh, clinical meet, we can uh, touch the figure of 100. I am uh, it's 56 for that. Indrani, we have to add the physical presence, right? So if you add the physical oh, yes. presence, then uh, yes, we, yes, we have yes, 70, yes. I think. Uh, more, more than 70. The house is totally full. No, That's a great thing. Thank you. Uh, Any so comments, Sushmita, regarding the meeting and house things? I think really smooth, uh, very stylish, excellent cases. Uh, I... What, what struck me most is that with each of these cases, you had to persevere, not just with the diagnosis, but even with the management. So often, you know, we uh, talk about complex cases and we talk about diagnosis and we stop there. But the nice thing about these cases is it's so difficult to, in our uh, in our situation to treat chronic cases properly, follow them up to improvement and then show what you're going to do long-term. And that's what I liked about this case is that there was a long-term management and outcome also mentioned in the majority. Um, that is often the harder part of our uh, treatment goals. So that's what I particularly